now that we are on uh, our topic of tech, uh, what do you think about AI? I mean, uh, Devnil, uh, what will how how AI is going to actually uh, you know come in 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 uh, you know med tech or in the tech uh, world and how it's going to change our life? So uh, I guess uh, there are two part of it is that uh, uh, one is the <clears throat> Uh, the adoption will essentially depend mostly on the uh, advancement of technology as a whole, uh, the base core underlying technology. I think a lot of us, we lose the focus is uh, the computational power that has humongous uh, growth over the years. Uh, that has made a lot of things available. Just imagine um, cloud was not even available to us by 2000, before 2006. Now, if I take you 10 years back, even GPS was not even available. Uh, I mean, uh, now if I take the GPS out of it, all this ride hailing is gone for toss. If I take cloud out of it, you just imagine uh, how much more money we had spent on on-premise. And even after this uh, 16 years of uh, uh, cloud's presence, and that has grown exponentially, I would say, uh, um, and the services being offered by uh, top-notch vendors uh, with very in, in, with impeccable track records. Yet, uh, even in America, 50%, uh, slightly over 52% is on cloud. 48 is still on-premise. So there's a huge amount of opportunities that are there. The same way if you in AI, if you see um, the trend probably has started to catch on around 2017, 18 and all that, but it has a long way to go. And along the way, a lot of things are developing. Initial part of AI, we saw machine learning. And that's where you know we were teaching the machines how to uh, work like us or behave like us. So therefore, if you dislike more the Siri kind of a thing, if, if Siri doesn't have the questions and the answers, it cannot handle it. Uh, but over time, and, and training these machines up were a humongous task. Uh, and that slowed us that option curve. But now with the advancement in uh, computing power in technology as such, we today are using increasingly um, uh, things which are beyond just being codes. So today we have large uh, influx of no code, low code, and then we have deep learning. Now with, when I compare no code, low code with deep learning and all, we are able to uh, do the same thing much faster. Hence uh, the training process gets compressed for the machines and therefore they are able to do very similar acts much faster, much better and, and much cheaper. Uh, so that's the kind of adoption uh, that is happening. For example, even if I now take it back one step and take it to med tech, just imagine we need to uh, feed the machines with um, live uh, data. So these use cases themselves will provide that user base from where going back to our diabetic retinopathy example, it is able to uh, compare and catch it very early. I mean, it's all about where you, uh, uh, again, cancer, you get stage three cancer as compared to stage one cancer. Diabetic retinopathy at the very onset or at, at the end of it. Diabetes, after you had 10 years of blood sugar, uh, then you start on diabetes, you're almost uh, half of your vessels and your kidney and your eyes are all gone. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, it's all about how early you get these advanced warnings and therefore how preventive, both in terms of lifestyle, as well as in terms of uh, using medication, how preventive uh, you are. And that's where all the transition happens. And then while this becomes a very big business, that means the, uh, the diagnostics and the preventability of it and predictability of it, at the same time, because it is preventive and not curative, the pressures on heavy assets, like hospital beds, they get reduced. You have less people getting admitted. You have more pressure in the OPD and even the OPD pressure now goes out into uh, video conferencing. In here, so much of the follow-ups you don't even need to do. Perhaps the doctor need to see once and the doctor is able to monitor much better so that there is very room, very little room for the patient not to behave. Because most patients in this kind of, uh, you, know, you know, chronic diseases, they actually don't behave. They may not be taking sugar at home, but they may be going to the uh, coffee shop and having a sugar laden tea or a coffee. Uh, that's their indulgence. So all these things immediately can, can, can be caught if, if, if it is in the app and if every day the data is going into the app. And then uh, there are so many things, like for example, we are still not able to do a few things. 
For example, this watch can do a lot of stuff. The, the latest version of the watch, again, medtech, AI, how, how it has gone into let us see. For the woman, it has been uh, a game changer, particularly who had difficulty in conceiving. It can actually now predict your menstruation cycles and your exact ovulation time. So therefore, see, and this is all done through your body temperature changes. Mm. But having said that, it still, it can do me my blood pressure. It can do me my pulse rate. It can do me my ECG, but it cannot tell me what is my sugar surge after I have the lunch? What is my postperitoneal two hours after my lunch? What is my uh, actual uh, glucose count? It's still not there. Now, if there is anybody for uh, stage one diabetes, it's very important for them even to have this. Even for us, one of the main problems in, in diabetes is to understand what are the diets that are giving you that spike and take that out. Because that's where insulin and pancreas fails over years and years of neglect. Mm. So you see how we are able to now solve the problem in a much better way by looking at different parameters. So this is what we call first principles. Go down to the core of the problem, try to see where, where what you need to break down, what data points you need to analyze it, and what data points should be uh, treated in what way and what data points should be discarded. Um, so that makes a, a very different, uh, um, uh, it's actually a game changer. And every time we are getting into inflection point, we are hoping every time there's a new watch announcement, uh, we hope that we would have got the sugar thing, still not there, but I'm very excited with whatever came in the eight they have just launched. Uh, and the manufacturer themselves is claiming and of a repute of Apple. Uh, so I would not uh, throw them out of the window by saying these are fake. Many doctors do. You know, and that's where you know the adoption curve in the medical industry is very poor. I don't know whether they do it because they feel threatened, uh, and they want this kind of a scenario where there are twenty patients every day waiting in their chamber where he has the capacity to see ten. Uh, or fact, is it... in fact, uh, Devnil, that was my question going to be for Arjun: is that while there is so much of positive about AI, what do actually doctors think, and what do the industry people think? Do they really take it that positively, or they feel? that it is probably going to, uh, you know, harm the uh, uh, humanity and disrupt a lot of uh, things in the wrong way? You, you know, a great question. And I agree with all the points that they've been made. Uh, point is, I think it's a mixed bag right now. It's early days. Uh, you know, awareness is low. Uh, lots of new things are coming on. It's a, it's a buzzword that people are using a lot. It's early days. Where I see it is already helping, where it's something like, uh, you know, drug delivery uh, or it's continuous monitoring. I think there's a general acceptance that this is helpful. Like, uh, you know, they've been used the example of diabetes. There are people that are continuous glucose monitoring machines and, you know, they will take the activities of the individual and put a bolus of uh, insulin into the body. Let's say a person is going to go and play a football game. They can get on with their lives without having to worry about halfway through the game, I need to go out and get an insulin shot. That is taken care of it. I think that sort of things is generally accepted. Okay, where it is going to become a part of a reimbursement cycle or it becomes part of a clinical study, I think the jury is out on that. And for that, I think the technology folks, the, the med tech folks will need to bring the regulators along in that journey and the ride. So will you get reimbursed from uh, something there? That's another story. Or how much clinical data do I need to get? How many years of clinical data do I need to get to prove that this therapy works? That's an unknown to me. Now, as far as doctors are concerned, there is a cynicism there, okay? Uh, obviously, especially among some of the older generation doctors who are historically treated people in, in, the, in the right way. But I think, again, there's some education to be done. Okay, then this starts with probably the younger generation of doctors and getting them educated and the benefits of it, that they are not going to get overworked, their life is going to get easy. Uh, they, they are not going to have people panicking and running to them at every stage. Uh, <coughs> patients can manage them themselves. So I think there's, it's a process like everything else. And I think what's going to happen, if the doctors are probably worried about what does the patient do with that data? Okay, now you see suddenly your hypertension has shot up through the roof. Your Apple Watch has told you that. But how are you going to react to that? What do you do about it? Do they know 
enough to treat themselves and, and find a solution. I think that's a concern. So that the ecosystem has to come together. And I think there's a lot of awareness and education that is going to be required uh, before we can say, hey, this thing is conquered. Maybe uh, just to add to what Arjun just said here, I, I, we are seeing two very clear distinct trends. Um, um, and very much taking that where he left, like uh, uh, we believe that the adoption or the inflection point or the um, growth in the adoption curve uh, will take place all driven from necessity. And, and that's what we are seeing. The economies, the countries, even uh, among the G7 countries, where the the, the stress and the strain on the ecosystem, uh, the medical ecosystem is significantly higher, is uh, where the adoption is happening much faster. The regulators are bending, bending behind, bending backwards to put or uh, allow new things to happen. The kind of, you know, so we have invested in a company called um, 23andMe, and they have got uh, initially six approvals for three chronic and two terminal illnesses. Um, to uh, uh, use genetic uh, uh, gene data to prepare uh, single dose effective um, med medication. Now, these kind of things and this company, their uh, license uh, to do all these things were uh, suspended sometimes earlier, uh, just after the global financial crisis uh, and so on. But then it got restored. Uh, in, in 2014, 15, and since then they had a wonderful journey, they got new licenses. So there's a huge mindset change that is coming within the regulatory uh, uh, framework as well. And particularly in those countries where uh, they are realizing that um, they are lagging behind, they are not able to uh, provide the treatment um, uh, that is needed uh, to, to the needy. Uh, so uh, that, that's one side of it. And of course, uh, you know, uh, the younger doctors are more more open to uh, adopting these kind of plays uh, because that gives them a better work life balance. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the only glitch that remains is that there is a lot of uh, regulatory uh, overhang in terms of uh, codes of conduct and ethics and things like that. And but then uh, I think um, in in Asia and all we are rather behind. We are rather bo uh, um, bogged down by this code of conducts and this kind of stuff and um, what could be the fallout. But I, I see that uh, it, it's especially our main focus being in US, in the US and in the UK, we see uh, things are really uh, getting out there fast. There was like a whole lot of controversy uh, during COVID, it was very helpful. There was no choice. So the adoption curve uh, grew exponentially. And then there was this question whether this rapid adoption curve will remain or it is after COVID that we'll go back to physical visits to the doctors. But what I look at that when I look at the millennial generation, um, the people who are born after 85 and all that, they, they are going to be tomorrow's consumer. They are uh, gradually increasing their share and in the, at, at the expense of the baby boomers. And they are ones who are not going to go back. They have better use of their time. Uh, and so therefore, uh, it's very clear that, you know, with passage of each uh, month, year uh, from COVID, that um, much of that uh, adoption that has happened is going to stay. These are very welcome changes. If, if this would have reversed, uh, then uh, we would have said that, you know, we are still quite far away and, and the time is still not right. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, just to add to that uh, point, uh, Shitana Devi, you know, it's always a journey. These things are always a journey. Uh, there will be some bumps along the road. If I go back maybe 25, 30 years, uh, you know, when the cardiac stents were introduced, uh, that was quite, uh, you know, instead of opening up a person and doing a full open heart surgery, there was a minimally invasive uh, intervention. And when that was introduced, the cardiac surgeons resisted that very heavily because they felt that they would be out of work. And so the, the stent companies picked a whole bunch of younger generation cardiologists that were coming through who didn't have that resistance to change and created a new brand of cardiologists called interventional cardiologists who, who could put stents in and they were trained, worked through that handheld through that process. And now you have a system where there's room for both. The cardiac surgeons are not out of business, but there's interventional cardiologists and the patient is better off. So a lot of cases, they don't have to go through the trauma of a full-fledged cardiac surgery. They can get an interventional uh, stent put in. So I think like everything else, this will be a journey. 
Absolutely. And that journey is actually falling in place. COVID has accelerated it significantly. We should thank COVID for that, although it has created a lot of misery uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, but some of these, like they were, uh, you do have taken maybe five, 10 years to reach where we have already reached. And the good part of it is that we are increasingly seeing um, much of that is not getting reversed, uh, especially uh, where it matters the most. Devni, uh, when it comes to medtech, which are those uh, pockets or geographies you think where you know fabulous or disruptive uh, innovation is happening? Sure, I think um, again, um, necessity is the mother of all innovations, right? So there has to be a real uh, burning need. And um, some of the developed countries, they today have that, that kind of a need because their health, uh, so they have taken on the onus of providing uh, health for everyone. And that's how they are G7 countries or developed countries and all that, that's one of the main parameters of OECD. Uh, but then um, over time, as we have started living longer and then cost of uh, administering these programs have become um, expensive and the governments are today are much less resourceful than they were at one point in time. I guess um, there is a huge amount of um, mindset change that is happening. Um, and many of the, I think uh, uh, the lawmakers are breathing down the regulators to change the mindset. It's again, uh, bringing in new, uh, infuse new blood. Like if you bring in uh, millennials to work in all spheres of life, say the doctors, the regulators, uh, the patients, this adoption curves will uh, really go through the roof. Towards that end, I think both in terms of innovative business models, as well as their um, uh, new, uh, new ways of delivering them and making them reach out to the consumer uh, ha has uh, really uh, uh, taken a front seat in, uh, in the US in most of these things, uh, it has been a leading play. Uh, then, of course, from a need standpoint, UK and also slowly going into most of European economies, particularly the more developed northern European economies. Um, but then uh, as the southern European ones are reeling under uh, pressure and the, like Italy has got one of the most long living people out there, they uh, need to adopt these things faster. And, and so those, that's all that is more happening. Uh, and then, uh, of course, technology will come in and make that happen. Another place where we see out of all these, a lot of work happening, uh, again, uh, more de tech defensible, more, uh, uh, you know, things that are uh, uh, yet to be proven. At the same time, there is effort to disrupt the current status quo is Israel. A lot of work is happening, whether it's, uh, you know, robotic surgery, whether it is uh, related to early development of uh, or early uh, diagnosis. So like, you know, we have 7 billion proteins in our body. How these proteins fold, if we can find a pattern on that is what we will be able to tell you or uh, tell uh, that for each one of us, what kind of diseases that we are more susceptible to. So this kind of work is also happening. Uh, like that we see in um, Israel, a, a lot of deep defensible work is happening. And despite the fact that, you know, they may not have that kind of a need, uh, but in everything else, like in cyber, also Israel. Uh, so uh, that's another area of our focus where we have uh, seen a lot of work happening. And from there, most of these work go to US and then uh, some goes to UK or uh, to other parts of the world, uh, mostly Europe. Uh, but that's very, very interesting touch point. A, a lot of uh, you know new things are being uh, tried out there. Uh, and it's all about trying. Um, even few, one or two out of 10, if it succeeds, I think we have a wonderful outcome.